Hello and welcome to Historia Podcast with me, Jack Pettit, and our resident historian, Paul Fletcher. This is our Cold War Origins series. Episode four, already. And the question we're going to be trying to answer today is, why was Soviet expansion of its control over Eastern Europe so important for the development of the Cold War? Fletch. Hello. Hello again. Again, indeed. Here we go again. Right. Let's let's kick off. Let's start with um, provide a, a narrative, a, an, an overview of um, events to try and help describe what's going on. So let's start at Yalta, 45, and let's end with Czechoslovakia in February of 48. Okay. So Yalta was very clear about what was going to happen with Eastern Europe. Uh, by Eastern Europe, we're talking about the countries of Poland, uh, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Bulgaria, Romania, uh, and uh, what was then Yugoslavia, which of course doesn't exist anymore. Um, and what it said was that Eastern Europe would be a sphere of influence of the Soviet Union. In other words, it would be allowed to dominate that area and to very much be in charge of decision making about what was going on there, which is not the same as saying it was going to control it completely. And it certainly was not going to take over those countries. Those countries were going to remain free, sovereign, independent countries. In other words, they'd have a flag, they'd have a government, they'd have a head of state, they'd have a football team, they'd go to the Olympics. Unlike, for example, Estonia, Lithuania and Latvia, which all become part of the Soviet Union after World War II. So that was one thing. But on the other hand, Stalin had promised to offer free and fair elections. Which is contradicting the yeah. idea of a, yeah. of a sphere of influence, Absolutely. isn't it? Absolutely, because the problem with that was going to be that any free and fair elections were going to produce, if not an anti-communist government, were almost certainly going to produce an anti-Russian government because it isn't just about communism, it's about national identity as well. And most European countries do not want, did not want to be and still do not want to be dominated by Russia. So that is the situation after Yalta. Now that seems to be the fact that the Soviet Union is dominant there is confirmed that Potsdam when the borders of Poland are moved westwards uh, Russia took part of eastern Poland in order to therefore move its borders further away from Moscow and Leningrad. And in turn, the Polish border was moved west, was taking the land from eastern Germany, going up to the River Oder. So that's fine, as it seems to be. The problem is, of course, is that actually, as you've said before, we have two contradictory ideas and how are they going to be implemented? So. What all those countries follow um, between 1945 and 1948 is they all follow a similar pathway or pattern with the exception of Yugoslavia, which I mentioned at the end. You basically get the formation of a coalition government of which the Communist Party of that area is only one part. But interestingly, normally the Communists control the army, the secret police and the police forces. In other words, those parts of the government that are going to be about controlling people. So a coalition meaning a group of political parties yeah. Yeah. Uh, ruling the yeah. country. So there'll be other non-communist parties within that government. Right. Often the prime minister is from a non-communist party. What then happened was that you would have some sort of rigged election in which there wasn't free and fair competition. As a result of that, the Communist Party would then win. And then after that, the Communist Party would then impose a one party state, not allowing any other parties to exist. And that, that new government would also then uh, enter into some sort of uh, deal or arrangement with the, um, with the, the Russians, the Soviets, um, as a result of which that part, that country would then become a satellite state of the Soviet Union. In other words, not, not being taken over completely, but effectively controlled for all the big decisions. So what countries are you actually talking about here? Well, 
all of all the ones I mentioned previously, Poland, Romania, they all went at various different times. So the first country to go was Bulgaria in 46. Uh, in 47, you've got that process complete for Poland, for Hungary, um, and then and Romania. And then in 48, the last of those countries to go was um, Czechoslovakia. Okay. And that, of course, that idea of them being under the political control of the Soviet Union was confirmed by the creation of this organization called Common Form, which they all belong to. And clearly, they were getting political instruction or political direction from, um, from Moscow. Common Form, Communist Information Bureau. Yeah. 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 So that is, so that, that, that's, where where we're up to in terms of the expansion into Eastern Europe of Soviet uh, influence or domination, or dominance, I should say. The one exception to this was, of course, Yugoslavia. Um, that actually went on its own pathway, refused to accept, for a whole variety of reasons, refused to accept uh, Russian or Soviet control and uh, tried to do a, a more independent uh, way forward as a result of which it was thrown out of the Eastern Bloc and then um, and then for the rest of the Cold War went to some sort of independent line being more pro-Western and less and not and opposed to Stalin. But they were very much the exception rather than the law. Fantastic. Right, thank you. Really helpful. So let's let's answer that big question, or let's try and answer that big question. And that is, of course, why was this expansion, this Soviet expansion, into Eastern Europe, over Eastern Europe, so important for the development of the Cold War? Well, the the problem is that you've got two different interpretations of what's going on, and these are fundamentally contradictory interpretations. So people in the West and Western governments in Paris or in London or in Washington, what they saw is that they saw increasing Soviet control of Eastern Europe as being proof that all that the Soviet Union wanted to do was expand its power and to impose communism over all of Europe and eventually over the globe. So therefore, you know, today Prague, tomorrow Paris. And this therefore convinced people and justified uh, actions whereby the idea would be that you, the only way to deal with the Soviet Union was you had to stand up to it, you had to be tough with it, you had to be firm with it. Um, and so therefore you can see that, for example, Truman Doctrine, I mean, the Truman Doctrine is quite clearly, in 1947, the Truman Doctrine is quite clearly based upon the idea that the Soviet Union wanted to expand. It wanted to take over. It was Greece and Turkey in particular for the Truman Doctrine, first of all. Um, and this, this whole idea was justified by what was going on in Eastern Europe. So one reason why it's important one reason why Soviet expansion into Eastern Europe is important because the West viewed it as expansionist aggressive. As proof that what it saw it as was a proof that the Soviet Union was by its very nature expansionist and aggressive and would look to expand beyond Eastern Europe. And that explains... According to the West. According to the West. Sure. And that explains and justifies a whole series of actions. So... Truman Doctrine, Marshall Plan. I mean, the Congress actually voted for accepted martial aid directly because of the Czech takeover by the communists in February 1948. Before so, that, Congress wasn't going to vote possibly for martial aid. And then beyond that, okay? So you, you get, so uh, Berlin blockade is further proof of the expansionism of the Soviet Union, and therefore you get the Berlin airlift, and you get the formation of NATO. So you can see that that expansion into Eastern Europe is a primary cause of the, de of the decline in relations, or in other words, the start of the Cold War between 46 and 49. Mm. Sorry, you have to interrupt. Well, that, I mean, I was going to say, that's the, that's the Western yeah. perspective, yeah. interpretation. What about Stalin's point of view? Well, Stalin's viewpoint, of course, was he thought he was justified in doing what he did. So he thought that Yalta had given him the green light, uh, and quite rightly so from his, you know, his view. Um, Germany had been invaded. 
You've got to remember that warfare in those days, there weren't ICBMs, there weren't long range missiles. So, you know, to be attacked meant you had to walk, get through the ground, you had to be across the ground. So, therefore, if he had a succession of friendly states, remember, Hungary, Romania, for example, had both fought with Germany in the Second World War against the Soviet Union. So therefore, what he was looking for, a succession of friendly states, okay, that could be relied on, to the very least not attack him and actually help defend the Soviet Union. So friendly if towards it was a, him. Friendly towards that, yeah. In other words, for them to be satellite states, not part of the Soviet Union, but very much doing what the Soviet Union wanted to do. So for Stalin, all these uh, complaints and all this behaviour about, for example, uh, Trim Doctrine or martial aid, Stalin didn't see that as justified defensive measures against Soviet aggression. What Stalin saw that was that the West was not keeping its promises, was not keeping its agreements. And in actual fact, he saw the defensive measures as aggressive, as we'll see later on in another podcast. You know, he saw martial aid and quite rightly, actually, as an aggressive attempt to break up his dominance of the Eastern Bloc. So what Stalin did in response to that was to hold the Eastern Bloc even more tightly to him. Creation of Comic-Con in 49, then the creation of the Warsaw Pact in 55. And so what this is, what it did, this expansion into Eastern Europe, was it, it just divided the East and the West even more solidly into two distinct and hostile camps who saw each other as the enemy. So that's in the short term, which is why it's important. But in the long term, it has another importance, which is that it's a constant reminder during the, this is Soviet occupation or dominance of, of Eastern Europe. It's a constant reminder of the fact that the Soviets controlled and wanted to control countries that didn't want to be controlled by it and was willing to do so as the West saw it. And so you get 53, there's an uh, uprising in, Ber in Berlin and in Eastern Germany. In 56, you've got the Hungarian uprising. Uh, 68, you've got the Prague Spring. 1980s, you've got the protests by Solidarity in Poland. And all of those protests are all suppressed by force, either directly by the Red Army, because of course, remember, the Red Army had liberated, in inverted commas, all those countries at, during the end of the Second World War, and they had remained stationed in those countries after 1945. So the Red Army suppressed all those protests. And what that did was it just served as a constant reminder to the West that the Russians couldn't be trusted, the, ones were, the Russians were aggressive, the Russians were expansionist, the Russians were looking to impose communism on other people who didn't want it. And the only way to deal with this was to stand up to them. Mm. And therefore it kept on, kept on repeating the justification for the Cold War. And if you really want to think about how important this is, and look at the end of the Cold War. What are the three things that you know, we can say and show the Cold War ended? Well, one was the fact that the Soviet Union abandoned communism. Two was the end of the uh, arms race, particularly between USA and the Soviet Union. But the third actually is the collapse of Soviet control over Eastern Europe symbolized by the knocking down of the, the fall of the Berlin Wall. And that's why I think that Soviet expansion between 1945 and 1948 and its increased dominance of Eastern Europe is absolutely fundamental both to the start of the Cold War and then also the maintenance of it as well beyond that. Brilliant. So just um, 20 seconds summarize what we've just uh or what you have just beautifully um spoken about so why is the soviet expansion of its control of eastern europe so important for the okay. development of well i would say in the short term two interpretations about what's going on and the reaction is that both sides see what the other is doing as being aggressive and therefore breaking down the trust and therefore causing the cold war to begin and then in the longer term you see that can dominance of Eastern Europe as being a constant reminder of how the West saw and sees Soviet Union. 
and therefore continues to justify the Cold War and to make greater cooperation and greater peace between the two sides very, very difficult indeed. Brilliant. Thank you so much. That's fine. Um, thanks for listening. Next time is uh, episode five. We're looking at the Truman Doctrine and, of course, the idea of containment. See you then.